Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting me back. Is is this loud? It's It's okay. Okay. All right. So the last three weeks, today's the fourth, we've been talking about the world of, excuse me, Second Temple Judaism. Okay. And specifically the first century of the Second Temple Judaism, meaning the, the century in which Jesus lived. That's what we're concentrating on. And it was a pretty wild world. There were lots of things going on. There were politics, there was religion, there was culture, there was language, all sorts of things. Okay? And last week, we spent a good bit of time talking about the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the world of Jewish sectarianism, or the world of Jewish parties. And one of the things that I left you with was wanting to think about the Pharisees in a very positive light, and <clears throat> as people who genuinely and authentically wanted to worship the God of Israel. And in order to do that, they felt that what they had, what they had the written word, the Torah, that that was really important. And if you're going to call yourself a Jew for a Pharisee, you want to live like a Jew. You want to live the way that God wanted you to live. And so in some ways, I suppose I was trying to give an apology for the Pharisees. Because sometimes we get the sense that they were just so focused on the minutia that they forgot the big picture and that they were legalistic. And and I'm just not sure that's the best way to think about the Pharisees. I think they genuinely wanted to follow the God of Israel. In order to do that, they had to know what God required of them, which means they had to look at the law. And they had to figure out how exactly God wanted them to live in this world. So we talked about Sadducees and Pharisees. We're going to talk about the Essenes, a third group today. And more specifically, a small group of the Essenes, the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay? Um, I'm going to say one more thing about the Pharisees, and then we'll jump into the Essenes and the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I didn't get through all the passages in the handout that I gave you last time. And you don't have, I don't expect you to have it. Um, I don't have it with me. Uh, But the top one, it was the biggest passage. It was a ref, it was a passage from Mark 7. And in Mark 7, there's a question that the Pharisees bring to Jesus. And they say, why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands? Why are they eating without washing their hands first? And what Mark will tell you then is that this eating with unwashed hands was a tradition of the elders or the tradition of the fathers. That's code for, this is a Pharisaic understanding of what should happen. So when you hear in the Gospels, if you see the phrase, the traditions of the fathers or traditions of the elders... That means there's a Pharisaic interpretation behind that. So Mark will mention it, Matthew will mention it, Paul will mention it once or twice. These traditions are the things that the Pharisees are sometimes criticized for in their time. What the Pharisees believed is that when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave the Ten Commandments. And, And more fully than that, really, he gave them the written law. But the Pharisees thought there was also an oral law that was given. So what that means for the Pharisees, the Pharisee says, yes, we have a text in front of us, but how are you supposed to interpret the text? How do you interpret it faithfully? And they said, God also whispered in Moses' ear how to interpret it. And the Pharisees said that they were the inheritors of that oral law, that they were the ones who knew what God had whispered to Moses. And so that's, how, that's the authority that they... Base, that's, that's how they base their authority on how people should, why people should understand how they interpret the law. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you see traditions of the elders, that's what that means. And I mention that because that phrase kind of appears in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I'll come back to it. Okay? All right. So for the Essenes, the Essenes were a third main Jewish sector party in, Second Temple, in the Second Temple Jewish world. None of these groups were large. The Sadducees maybe had a few hundred The Pharisees had 6,000, apparently, followers, and the Essenes had about 4,000. If you figure that Jerusalem had a population of 150 to 200,000, and then you've got the rest of the population of the country, they're very small numbers, okay? And most people did not belong to any of these parties, Pharisees, Sadducees, or Essenes. But they were influential. Each of these groups were influential in their own way. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that they interpreted the Torah in certain ways, okay? All right, so the Essenes were one of these groups. We don't know a lot about them. We know more about the Pharisees and Sadducees. 
But we do know a lot about one small group of Essenes, and that small group of Essenes were the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I have a few slides for you to orient you to where this small group of uh, Jews lived, who lived at the shores of the Dead Sea. So to orient you, this is the Mediterranean Sea, Sea of Galilee, and here's the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest spot on earth. It's about 1,300 feet below sea level. It's very hot. And the, it's called the Dead Sea, not because it's hot, um, but because it's very salty. In fact, it's got one of the highest saline contents of any, um, of any sea in the world. And if I have the numbers right, some of you can correct me, like the, the ocean, Atlantic Ocean, it's about like 3 or 4% salt, I think. Does anyone, can anyone correct me on that? Okay, just believe me? Perfect. <laughs> the Dead Sea is like 35% salt. It's really salty. So much so that you can float. So this is not me. I just grabbed this picture from the internet. Um, and the shore where you'd expect sand, sometimes you see salt. It's just so salty. Okay? I'm going to go back to this page from it. On the northern edge of the Dead Sea, northwest edge, is the site of Qumran. Okay, so this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written, and the community who lived here were the people who were responsible for these scrolls. There's a story that goes along with the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In 1947, a, a Bedouin a shepherd boy, so a, an Arab boy of maybe 12, was out with his goats or sheep on the shores of the Dead Sea trying to find some vegetation. That's not very easy. Unless you're there from like March through May, it's easy. Otherwise, it's not. And according to the story, and it's hard to know exactly if all the details are right, but according to the story, he was trying to get his sheep or goats out of this very rocky area where there was a couple caves. And so he threw a stone up there to try and scare them, and he heard something shatter. So he went up to check it out, and what he found was that he had inadvertently broken an old uh, pottery vase or a pottery jar. And when he opened, when he looked inside, he saw little fragments there. And he didn't know exactly what they were, but he, they were fragments of scrolls. And so he picked them up, and there were four of them in there. And he took them to Bethlehem, because he knew there were some antiquities dealers in Bethlehem who might be interested in old scrolls. He didn't know how old they were. He just knew that they were there. And the shopkeeper in Bethlehem, his name was Kando, um, he had an inkling about what these might be, that they, they at least look old. And he became convinced that they were very old. And so, as antiquities dealers often do, he tried to sell them. And he was asking a lot of money, and no one wanted to pay his price. And the scrolls, these four scrolls, and then there was, the, there was actually seven in total, because the same boy went back and found three more scrolls. So there were seven scrolls. They went on exhibit around places in the United States. Um, one of those was Duke Chapel. So they were on display in Duke Chapel for a week or two. And there was an ad put out in the New York Times um, offering to sell the scrolls to anyone who was willing to pay $250,000. And no one in the States really wanted to do it. Duke was actually really close to doing it. Um, but no one did it. And then through kind of third channels, the state of Israel actually bought them. Um, because they knew that they were stolen, but they also knew that they were old and they were Jewish. And some people who had taken a look at them thought that they were authentic. So the state of Israel bought them and then now they're housed in Jerusalem. Okay, so that's the, kind of the story of the finding. What it set off was a huge um, um, expedition, really, by many different people to find more scrolls. Okay? So all the stuff I've told you about that happened in a place called Cave One. So Cave One is here. There are now 11 caves where scrolls were found. It, it, all within a period of like five to eight years. And about 900 fragments of scrolls were found. Some were complete. I'll show you some pictures. Some were very fragmentary, very fragmentary. But they were all here, okay? So that's the modern story. We'll come back to that. But I want to go back to the ancient story. I'm trying to remember what slides I have for you. Oh, yeah. There are other, there are other things along the Dead Sea. If any of you have been to Israel, you've probably been to Masada. Um, this is a huge fortress that King Herod built. It's on the south end of the Dead Sea. So if I go back, Masada's down here. Okay, so other things were built along here. But it's desert. There's not a lot of water here, especially. And, okay, this is a picture now. This is a modern path now. The path wasn't there before. 
This cave right here is cave one. So that's where they found the first Dead Sea Scrolls, right here. This is cave two right here where they found some more. And then they ended up finding nine more caves with scrolls. And the most famous one um, I'll show you in a few minutes. All right, so the ancient story. There was a group of men. Um, there are a few people, a few scholars think there might have been a few women, but really it was a male community that set themselves up on the shores of the Dead Sea. If you were to ask why would you go out to the Dead Sea and live there, which is a really good question because it's very difficult to live out there, the answer seems to be because this community thought that what was happening in Jerusalem, especially the Jerusalem temple, was wrong. That the high priest in Jerusalem was um, illegitimate. That the sacrifices that the high priest was offering um, could not do what the high priest thought they could do. They were not efficacious. They, they just didn't work. Because it was the, the wrong high priest performing sacrifices in, an, in a kind of an illegal way. Okay, not according to their understanding of how, this, how the sacrifices should be offered. We talked about the calendar a little bit last week, how, Jerusalem, or how Judaism is on a loony solar calendar. These people were on a solar calendar. They were convinced that you needed to have a 364-day year, not a 354-day not a year, 365-day year. And so that's one of the reasons why I thought what was happening in Jerusalem was illegitimate, because they had the wrong calendar. They were offering sacrifices on the wrong day. Okay. Now, for people who think that the Pharisees were very strict interpreters of the law, they pale in comparison to these people. They were very, very strict. They were known for being strict. I'll give you a brief history of, of Qumran, and then we'll go back to what the community was all about. They seem to have started in about the year 100 B.C. Okay? So when they thought that the, what was happening in Jerusalem was wrong... They split, and they went to the shores of the Dead Sea, and they set up their own community. It was a monastic community, very small. And there was habitation there until the year 68 AD. So for 168 years, people were living here, give or take a couple of decades. It's hard to know exactly when they started. We know exactly when it finished, though, when people stopped living there. In 68 AD, the Roman army is here. And in the year 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem. But before they destroyed Jerusalem, they go around to many places in Israel and they conquer. And these people knew what was coming. So in 68 AD, they hid their scrolls in the caves. Okay, so they didn't usually keep the scrolls in the caves. They kept them in their community. But when the Romans are coming, they're hoping it's going to be a short-lived thing, a short-lived Roman intervention, invasion, and then when the Romans leave, they can go back to their normal life. So they hid their scrolls in caves. Um, the problem is the Romans did a much better job of tamping down the revolt than many people imagined, and so no one came back to this site. And the scrolls were, in a sense, lost, which is a great thing for us because we found lots of scrolls. It was not a good thing for them because most of them were killed. All right, this is the most famous picture of Qumran, this cave right here. This is cave four, so that little hole there. And actually, people came in from here. They dug a little hole in here to get in and found scrolls here. And this is an outline of the, uh, of the site. Now, I have these a little out of order, it looks like, so I'll go to this one. This is what the Qumran site looked like. So when the people were there, they lived here. All of these things are water. And you're in a place in the desert where it gets zero rainfall a year. Maybe one-tenth of an inch. Maybe. They've got six pools of water. That's not, this is not even drinking water. This is just for ritual immersion. So this, I showed you pictures of this last time. These are called mikvah oat. This is, if you want to be ritually pure, you had to go... And this one, you can go down one side, impure, and you go up the other side in a pure state. Okay, so this one actually has a divider, and it has two dividers, to be honest with you. And here's another picture of a mikvah, where you go down and you go up. This tells you how strict they were in interpreting the law. Because they said, if God says we have to be pure, even if we're in the middle of the desert, we're going to do it. 
Now, what the, they can see water from their site, but it's all salty water. They can't drink it. It's not good for anything. And they're using a, a huge amount of water just to immerse themselves in water and come out because they thought being pure was a really, really important thing. It tells you something about their zealousness, actually. How important they thought it was to follow the law. Yes? It was fresh water. It was not salt water. Um, partly because in, in Judaism, uh, living water is what's important. And salty water was seen as dead water because it couldn't bring life. Good question. I was hoping someone would ask that. So um, this picture is maybe the best one I have. There's, this is called a wadi. So you can kind of see it right here. And you can see it kind of right along here. Where when it does rain up in the hills, the water, a couple times a year, will come racing down. There's flash floods. And that water will then come and go into the Dead Sea. And so what they, what they built are diversionary things. So they, put, they built things so when the water comes down, they would, they would um, move it toward their community. And they would put it in pools. And then they could carry that water up to their site. But there was also, I mean, drinking water as well. So, um, I mean, water... In the desert, the water's, water's the most precious thing you have. And for them to devote this much time and energy to ritual immersion is pretty telling that they were, they were that focused on being pure. Um, there is a freshwater spring about 50, 10, 15 miles down the road. So if you really needed water, you could walk there and carry it back. But that's a long way. It's a long way. <clears throat> All right. I don't have a guide for what these numbers all mean, other than the threes are mikvaot. This, so they, they're ritual immersion pools. This is a cistern, so this was the one that was not just for ritual immersion, so this would be their, they would store water here. Here's two more mikvahs. But there are a bunch of different rooms here. So one of them, this one, this one, was their dining room. And you know that because in the room next to it, there was about a thousand uh, pieces of pottery found, jars, where you could put food. This one is thought of as the scriptoriums. So this might have been where they copied texts because they thought texts were important. I mean, so they've, they've kind of um, been able to figure out some of what ancient life was like there. And right, I'm going to go back to this. All right. The people who lived there, they were a splinter group of Essenes. Most of the Essenes did not seem to share the values of the Dead Sea community. Okay, so they were, they were a small subset. But I want to give you a few characteristics of the kind of people who would come and live here and what life was like for them out on the shores of the Dead Sea. First, we would, today we'd call this socialism. They shared the material possessions. So if you were going to be initiated into the movement and you had to be initiated in, you had to bring all of your earthly possessions and give it to the community. Now, you didn't do it right away. It was a three-year initiation so the first year, you could be a probationary member. It means you're just observing. You're living with them. But you don't get to eat or drink with the members of the community. You eat by yourself. Drink by yourself. After the first year, you get examined. And if your examination goes well, then you get to stay for another year. And you get to eat with the community. The pure food, the pure meal is what they called it. And if you made it another year got examined again, and then you got to eat the pure drink, which is probably wine or something like that. And then, as some, actually, people debate whether it's a two- or three-year initiation. And then either you're fully in or you have another year, and then you can decide if you're going to give all of your possessions to the community. All right, so you don't have to do it right away. But once you remember the community, the idea was you remember for life. You were in. Now, this was never a big community. A hundred at most. It was never big. And this is a problem with all, with every all-male community, is you got a problem of the continuous population. So they were, <laughs> they were very dependent upon converts to their way of thinking. Right? So they shared possessions. And admission into community was not an easy thing. They also clearly thought that writing was important, meaning copying texts of the Torah. It wasn't just the Torah, but knowing God's law and preserving God's law was important. Okay? And, and in a few minutes, I'll tell you about the different kinds of texts or scrolls that were found. 
But just in general, writing was important. It was something that they, it occupied a great deal of their time, it seems. Um, <clears throat> they definitely paid attention to ritual purity. The mikvah oat or the water pools tell you that. The communal meals they would eat together. The room was 22 meters long. No one knows exactly how it was set up. They think there was probably a table down the middle of some, some kind of table. Um, but we don't know for sure. But it would have been, you'd, you'd eat all your meals together once you were a full member of the community. Okay? And another thing we know about the community is that they liked to talk in code. We know this from the scrolls themselves. And so there's a lot we'd like to know about this community that we just don't know. For example, the founder of the community was someone called the Teacher of Righteousness. It'd be really nice to know who it was. But we don't know. The Teacher of Righteousness. The teacher of righteousness was opposed to the wicked priest or the lion. So some, it's probably one of the Hasmonean or Maccabean priests, high priests in Jerusalem. But we don't know which one. It's hard to know. And people's, there's about four different guesses as to which Hasmonean priest is being called the wicked priest. The Pharisees also get a name. They're called the seeker of smooth things. <laughs> the seekers of smooth things. And it seems to be, that's not a compl- it's not a compliment. What they're saying is, they're trying to make Torah observance easy. They're smoothing the way for people. But we in the community, we really follow God's law. It's interesting. All right, so they like to talk in code. The Romans were called the Kitim. They didn't know, so sometimes we know who they're talking about, but oftentimes we don't. It'd be very nice to know. Here's another thing about this community. They call themselves the sons of light. And everyone else was a son of darkness. Everyone else. So Jews in the ancient world had divisions. So you had Jews and you had Gentiles. Those were the basic divisions of the world. Jews or non-Jews. But the people of Qumran, they said, we are the sons of light. And everyone else, including every other Jew who's not part of our community, is a son of darkness. They're not part of the covenant people of God because they're not correctly following God's law. So how could they be God's people? Not very good. (laughs) But I also don't know how much they cared because they're like those crazy people out there. You know, so I, I don't think they were known for being strict interpreters of the law. They were known for being opposed to what was happening in Jerusalem. And I think they were known for being on the extreme end. And sometimes the people on the extreme end just other people just shake their heads and don't pay attention to them. Probably. Yeah. Yes. Are you going to mention anything about their, like, do they have an anthropology? They do. Okay. And we'll get to it. Okay. Yes. Was John the Baptist part of that community? Great question. There are lots of interesting connections or parallels between the Qumran community and the early Christian community. And one question that people have brought up is whether John the Baptist had been a member of, at Qumran or at least been kind of an initial probationary member for a while. And the reason why that's an interesting question is because they're very similar. So John is preaching out in the desert about 10 miles from here. He also thinks that water is important, right? So he's baptizing. We call it baptizing people. In Judaism, what would be called you're immersing people, right? In the same way that they thought water immersion was important. Um, John ate locusts and wild honey, which is the kind of food you could get. That's a lot of the kind of food that seems that these people ate. And probably most importantly is their eschatology or their understanding of what was going to come was similar in that they thought the end of the world was coming soon. So they are camping out in the desert saying, we are the only loyal people to the God of Israel and we're willing to be out here because we know God is going to intervene in human history really soon. And when God does, we're on his side. John the Baptist talks a lot about judgment. The ax is already at the root of the trees, he says. He's thinking that God's going to intervene really soon. And, he, and so, so there's some overlap in how, people, how John and the Quran community all conceived of the end. And so there are some parallels. Um, the honest answer to your question is we don't know if John the Baptist has ever a member of this community. It took the right kind of person to want to live in the desert. Um, 
One thing we do know, at least what the Gospels tell us about John, is that a lot of people were going out to John to hear him speak and to be immersed by him. Not many people were going to this place and hanging out with these people. All right, so there's, there, and there are differences too, but there are, there are definitely similarities between the two. Yeah. Yes. Somewhere back in my history, and I've got a long history, but um, I remember a story, and it was told as, you know, this was kind of a theory that Jesus spent some time with the Essenes. Mm-hmm. Is there any truth to that, or do we know? There's a better chance that John spent time with the Essenes than Jesus spent time with the Essenes. And one of the reasons for that is just location. So John seems to have been very active, very, in a very close proximity to these people, where Jesus' activity was almost exclusively in the Galilee region, so several days' walk. I think the connections that are sometimes made are because of, again, eschatology, the way that both John and Jesus thought the end was going to come, that God was going to intervene in human history at an, in the near future. Um, but there's not, there's not a close connection between Jesus and the Essenes, or Jesus and these people. Not as close as some people would like, I think. With the location of where John was in the desert, where do the majority, where do you think the majority of the people going to John came from? Hmm. Jerusalem, Galilee, or the tribes in the area? No. Yeah, what the Gospels say, if I remember correctly, is they'll say from all Judea, and the region of the Jordan. I think that's what they say. They might be more, there might be more specific. I can't remember which different gospels sometimes say have, little, have slightly different things to say on that. And so, I mean, what the gospels are trying to tell you is that people from kind of all over the near regions are coming. Where they would stay is difficult to know. Because if you're coming from Jerusalem down to where John was at the Jordan River, it's a solid day's walk. So you've got to stay somewhere, right? You could bring your tent um, most people probably didn't have tents. They just kind of slept out under the stars. I mean, you could do that. Um, but there may have been some inns or something along the way too. But Qumran does not seem to set up as a place where people would come and stay for the night. It, it, didn't, it wasn't like a hostel or something like that. You had to be on the inside to be invited in. Yeah, you had to be on the inside. Let me say one more, about this, one more thing about the strictness of this community, and then I want to talk more about the types of scrolls that were found and then eschatology, okay, what they thought of the end. All right, so I have something. Well, this is an English translation of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? And I want to read you just a few lines from something called the Community Rule. If you were going to be a member of this community, I thought I had a bookmark, but it's in the wrong spot. Okay, if you're going to member of this community, you had to know what you're signing up for. And I've said several times that they were strict, but now I want to give you a few examples. All right. For those who are in the community, if one of them, one of the people in the community, has lied deliberately in matters of property, meaning, I think, they've not given all of the goods that they have. They've only given some. This reminds me a little bit of Ananias and Sapphira and Acts. If any of them is lied deliberately in matters of property, he should be excluded from the pure meal of the congregation for one year and shall do penance with respect to one quarter of his food. So he doesn't get to eat with the community for a year and he only gets 75% of what everyone else is getting. If any man has uttered the most venerable name, if they've taken the name of the Lord in vain, if they uttered the most venerable name, even though frivolously, they were just kidding, or as a result of shock, they hit their finger with a hammer, or for any other reason whatsoever, while reading the book or blessing, he shall be dismissed and shall return to the council of the community no more. You're kicked out. If he has spoken anger against one of the priests, he shall do penance for one year. This is a priestly community. A lot of the people in Jerusalem who thought stuff was not going well in Jerusalem, they were priests who then came to Qumran. Um, whoever has deliberately insulted his companion unjustly shall do penance for one year and shall be excluded. This means you're out of the community for a year, but then you can apply to come back in. Whoever has spoken foolishly, three months. Whoever has interrupted his companion while speaking, ten days. 
Whoever has fallen asleep during an assembly of the congregation, 30 days. <laughs> it's a good one, Mike. Yeah. <clears throat> it was a hard life for them, but they were convinced that they were the sons of light. And because of that, there were very high expectations placed upon them. Okay. The scrolls that were found. I'm going to give you some pictures. There's another picture of cave four right here. This is a uh, picture of the community rule. So one of the fragments or one of the copies of part of what I just read. Okay, this is one page of it or two pages of it. This is in really good condition. The next one I think is in really good condition. Four, it's called. So these are 1Q and 4Q. That tells you what cave it's from. So 1Q means cave 1, 4Q means cave 4. So it tells you what cave they were found in. Yes, it is not modern Hebrew, but it is Hebrew. The scrolls, most of them are in Hebrew. There are a few in Aramaic and a few in Greek. But like 90, 95% of them are in Hebrew. Yes. This is what a lot of them look like. I mean, they're 2,000 years old. So they survive, but a lot, oftentimes in, fragmentary, in a fragmentary state. And so it took a lot of work to try and put these back together. And not everyone was convinced they were put together in the right way. So scholars like to argue about this. Yeah, that's the end. I'll, I'll leave this one up. Just because this is what a lot of them look like. There were three main different types of scrolls found. Okay? The first is biblical manuscripts. So Old Testament books. This is all pre-New Testament. There's nothing from the New Testament. There's no mention of Jesus, no mention of John, no mention of Paul. It's all pre-New Testament, all these scrolls. So biblical manuscripts. There's... There's about 900 total scrolls, so figure, just think in terms of thirds. About a third of them were biblical manuscripts. Okay? Every Old Testament book, except for Esther, was found. And there are, um, in fact, I have the numbers here. Nine, so this is, you can tell what, was, what books were important to them by how many copies they had. Okay? So 19 copies of the book of Isaiah were found. 25 copies of Deuteronomy, it's a law, and 30 copies of the Psalms. So Psalms, Deuteronomy, and Isaiah. One, one law or Torah, one priest, one prophet. Or not one prophet, one writing, the Psalms, and then one prophet. Kind of three different divisions of the Old Testament. People have wondered why Esther was not found. Now, it could be happenstance. It could just be, there's no Esther they probably, maybe they had 50 scrolls, but they were in cave 12 and that one was destroyed. I mean, we just don't know, right? But there's no copy of Esther that was found. So one possible reason is it's just chance, right? Because all this is chance that they found these scrolls. But it could also be, and some people wonder about this, Esther is the only book in the Old Testament that never mentions God's name. And so it could be that there was a, a deliberate reason to not copy Esther or see it as important because it never actually mentions God's name. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't, but they didn't. Okay? Now, one of the reasons why this is so significant is because the Bible that you have today, I think all of you are probably reading in English. You're dependent upon people who translate for you, right? But you're also dependent, even though you don't know it, on all sorts of Greek and Hebrew manuscripts that are behind it. And there, if, if you're just talking the New Testament, there's 5,000 Greek manuscripts. There's a lot. Okay? And they're all slightly different. Most of those differences are, they don't matter. An A instead of a the. Or like just small things. Sometimes there's bigger differences. What these texts did is they moved the oldest copy of the Old Testament that we have backward a thousand years. So before this, the oldest manuscripts that existed of Old Testament books were from about the 9th century A.D., 800s and 900s, something like that, A.D. These are first century B.C., a thousand years earlier. And so what it was, scholars were able to do is to compare what we have today with what some group of some group Jews in the ancient world were reading back then, a thousand years earlier. For the most part, it's virtually identical. It's not identical. Anytime scribes are writing uh, by hand, there's going to be little differences. Those little differences... Um, 
leave once you have a printing press, because then you can exactly copy things, right? But before that, there's always going to be little differences. So there's, there's little differences. But what it was for most scholars is a confirmation that what we have today is about what they were reading in the first century, which is pretty amazing. Yes, I had a minister at one time who was, a, when he was doing his doctoral work, was translating an Isaiah mm-hmm. out of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm-hmm. And he said the only differences were where the writer of this particular Isaiah scroll mm-hmm. had fallen asleep and dropped a line or misspelled something, mm-hmm. but the particular Isaiah that he was given to translate was right on yeah. with the Isaiah we have today. It is very, very, very similar. It's amazing. Yeah? And one of the, Isaiah particularly, there's, there was a complete copy of the book of Isaiah found. Most of these books are not complete. They're, I mean, they have to be fragmented like this, where there's a whole copy of Isaiah. So, so that's the most interesting example, is because you can compare the, the whole text. All right, so there are biblical manuscripts. Yes, sorry. There are some manuscripts that were found that are, were not in the Bible, but were considered biblical that other people got a hold of and said, we don't want to let this out. This is too much information to even let to the population. There's, there's a... There's a mm-hmm. Some people say that. Yeah, so... There might not be a book of Enoch or some of these other books. Okay, you're going exactly where I'm going next. Perfect. <laughs> okay. A second group of scrolls that were found, again, about a third maybe are what we would call non-biblical Jewish texts. And they are ancient texts that some people found authoritative and other people did not. But everyone agreed that they were influential. So you mentioned First Enoch, right? First Enoch and Jubilees, there were a lot of copies of those two books found. First Enoch actually is mentioned in the New Testament, in the book of Jude. It mentions uh, the, the writings of Enoch, right? So... Um, anyway, I could list a whole bunch of non-biblical Jewish texts, stuff that didn't make it into the Old Testament, but were all pre-Christian texts. They're all stories. A lot of those texts are what we would call rewritten Bible. So they, Jews would go back and say, hmm, Enoch. We don't know much about him, but we do know that in Genesis 5 it says that he walked with God and then he was no more. What does that mean? Does that mean he never died? And if so, he's still alive in heaven and maybe we can communicate with him. And so first Enoch is actually a great example of what we would call an apocalyptic text, which it purports to tell you information about what was happening in heaven and so that you can know better how to live on earth. Okay. Other kinds of stories, there's something called the Genesis Apocryphon. It fills in the gaps. There's lots of details that I would love to know. For example, have you ever wondered why Abraham agreed to sacrifice his son Isaac and what Sarah was thinking and what Isaac was thinking? Well, there are books you can read because, there, because people want to know these questions. And so you have rewritten Bible. You have someone rewrote Genesis but filled in details. Why did Pharaoh invite Sarah into his house? Because the Genesis Apocrypha says that she was a more beautiful than any woman in the world. Right? It, just, it just fills in gaps. It fills in gaps. Okay? So there's a whole group of texts. Now, to, to go more pointedly to your question, I don't think anyone suppressed the documents. Okay? Um, they just were not seen as, a, um, as being written in the right time period to be included in the Old Testament. All of them are, I guess you would say, newer than any of the Old Testament books. Um, they're more recent. Um, they were influential. What they can do is tell you how people were interpreting Genesis in the time of Jesus. That they can tell you. But I don't think there was some sort of a conspiracy to keep certain books out or put some certain books in. Um, okay, the third group of texts that were found are what we would call community texts. So they tell us about the community itself, what they thought. So the community rule that I read a tiny bit of it to you, that's a community text or a sectarian text. It tells you what life was like in the desert and why they moved there and how they conceived of themselves. And again, there's a couple hundred scrolls to go with that. Okay, so there's 900-some scrolls that were found, at least fragments of them, stuff like this. Okay? And it's an astonishing find that gives you a window into the world of Jesus, into the world of the first century, and how a certain group of Jews were reading their Bible, what biblical texts they thought were important, how they conceived of themselves, like all sorts of things like that. 
All right, the last thing I want to talk about, because this is really important for Qumran, is their eschatology. What they thought about the end. And I'm emphasizing this partly because Christians were also eschatological. The Christian community also thought the end was coming soon. All right? So when we talk about Jewish eschatology, yes, sure, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y, eschatology. Um, Jewish, es- this is, I'm going to talk about broad, very broadly for a minute or two about Jewish eschatology, and then I'll focus on Qumran and the early Christians, okay? Jewish eschatology thinkers, so eschatolog- eschatologists, actually the term, they frequently thought that the end would be like the beginning. So the world was created perfect, the world would be renewed in a perfect way. So most Jewish um, eschatologists, meaning people in the first century who, th- was think- who were thinking about the end, they did not think about a totally new world. They thought about a redeemed world or a renewed world. So some of the books that I mentioned, Jubilees and First Enoch, they mention a new heavens and a new earth. The author of Revelation mentions a new heavens and a new earth. That was more the phrase. There'd be some newness, but you'd also have some similarities. There'd be a redeemed world. So the cosmos would not disintegrate Rather, the old order would end and a new and better order would begin. All right? Jews had a very rich understanding of how God could interact in the world. So if you think about the plagues in Egypt, or God sending manna in the wilderness, or God parting the Red Sea, I mean, there's a sense that God can act in the world. There was a, but there was an, also the sense that that was not just in the past. That God, if he wasn't doing it in the present... He would do it again in the future. God would interact in the world in very powerful ways. So eschatological thinkers are interested in thinking about the ways in which God would indeed interact with the world. But there were, um, so in terms, that's the broad category. But underneath that, a redeemed new world order and the fact that God would intervene, you had a lot of variety in how people understood the end and what would happen. In terms of Qumran specifically, they thought there would be a final battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness, but really God and the sons of light, so they would win. They were convinced that the Gentiles would uh, would come against, and it was usually considered as the Romans because they were the powerful people at the time, the Romans would come against the people of Israel, and some of the Jews who were not part of their movement would associate with the Romans and kind of be on that side. They would be on the wrong side. Um, And because they were sure the end was coming very soon, it mattered a great deal how they lived their life in the present because they had to be ready. And this idea became a very Christian idea as well. Paul talks about this a lot. Whenever he was thinking about what would happen when God would intervene, he says, in light of that, you need to be, uh, well, in 1 Thessalonians, be awake, be sober, be ready. And it's not just in First Thessalonians. Here's some other facets that are true in um, at the Dead Sea, true in early Christianity, and true in other parts of Judaism, Judaism as well. Messianism. There's an idea that Messiah would come. That it wouldn't just be that God would intervene, um, and that God would be the only actor in the show, that God would send a Messiah. That was a very deeply held belief. There was differences in how people conceived of that. So we'll talk, next week we'll talk more about the different types of messiahs that people expected. There's a lot of variety. But there was often this idea that a messiah would also come like kind of on behalf of God, that the messiah would almost be the general in the army would be is one way that people conceived of it. It's not the only way, but one way. There was also a deeply held belief in resurrection. That when you died, that was not the end. The Sadducees thought it was the end. Pharisees thought there was a resurrection. So did the Essenes, and so did these people, it seems. Okay? The way they buried themselves, you know that they were expecting to be raised from the dead in the end. They were all buried facing a particular direction, all in rows. I mean, they were, when, when the Messiah came, they would all rise back together, ready to fight on behalf of the Messiah. 
there was a sense that, I've said this before, but it wouldn't be a new world. It would be a new world, but it would just be really a redeemed, a redeemed new world. Not a, entirely, not a, not a world that was uh, totally distinct from what we have now, but something new. And that this would be the new age. Jews, by and large, did not talk about heaven. They talked about the age to come. That was the term that they liked to use. And it was, there wasn't a whole lot of detail of what that age would be. It was just, just going to be a good thing. And that the Messiah would be there. God would be there. It's going to be great. And there would be a new temple. Be a new and restored temple. Qumran community thought that. Other people thought that as well. I want to take one or two more minutes to talk about the resurrection. Then if you have any questions, I'm happy to address them. So one thing that I think that Christians have gotten away from um, is the idea of the resurrection. Classically, resurrection is the great Christian hope. Heaven is not the great Christian hope. Classically. Now, heaven is important. But heaven was seen as kind of an interim state. It wasn't the final thing that would happen. The final thing that would happen, Paul tells you, is that you would be raised from the dead. And so one New Testament scholar has put this in a kind of a, uh, a very pithy and remarkable way, and it helps me remember this. So for Christians, traditionally, classically, heaven is life after death. But resurrection is life after life after death. I'll say it again. Heaven is life after death. So when you die, you will be with Jesus. You'll be with God. But it's kind of, it's, an in, it's not the end The end is life after life after death when you are raised bodily from the dead and there is a new heaven and a new earth. That's the end in traditional Christianity. Okay? Paul makes a huge deal of that in 1 Corinthians. And some Jews made a huge deal of it. Qumran somewhat, the Pharisees for sure. Okay? And this is in the first century... Um, this idea of resurrection, of a bodily resurrection, is opposed to the Greek idea of what's called immortality of the soul, that your soul lived on, but your body just decayed because your your body was evil and it was transient and it just decayed. But the Jewish hope and then the Christian hope was that your body matters. How you live in your body matters matters. And that at some point, your body and soul would be reunited and you, you would be you again in a new way, right? You'd be a new body, a restored body, a powerful body. Paul will talk about it being um, an imperishable body, right? But resurrection is really the hope that Paul laid out to his converts. That, that was what they were looking for. And for him, that, then it mattered a lot how you live because your body would have some sort of eternal bearing. There'd be some, there's something true about whatever's true of you now is going to still be true of you. Uh, and his example is Jesus. So Jesus had a human body, died, he was raised from the dead. People recognized him most of the time, not all the time. But, his, but he came back bodily, right? He could walk through walls sometimes, which we can't normally do. The idea is that, that bo- he will have that body forever. But there was something about that body that people said, oh, that is Jesus. And we don't know exactly what that was other than he still had his scars, right? Thomas could put his hands in the side. He could feel the fingers. And some people have speculated, and I kind of like this. I don't know if it's true, but I kind of like it, that those things that we do for Jesus that might produce scars, they're kind of like badges of honor, really. Now, we might not see the scars physically. They might think, but you might be deeply wounded from having to stand up for what you believe sometimes, to stand up for the name of Jesus, and maybe some of that will carry on somehow. But I'm speculating. I don't really know. Okay? But resurrection was an important, a really important thing in the ancient world and in classic Christianity. It's always been an important thing. Yes? Mm-hmm. Right? Is that part of it? I mean, you said that when people 
it's a great question that I don't really know the answer to. I wish I did. Um, I mean, I can tell you that many Jews in the first century thought that resurrection was important. I can tell you that Paul thought it was really important. And for Paul, he ties it to holy living in the present. So if your body is going to last a lot longer than we think it's going to last, then the things we do to our body and the ways we live in our body have some sort of eternal significance. But that's about as far as I can go where I feel like I'm some, still on somewhat firm ground. I don't really know. Yeah? Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, I think purgatory comes from a diff- it's a different system of thinking. Um, and one of my colleagues at firm would be a lot better person to ask that question to than me. Um, but my understanding of purgatory is it's, a di- it's not tied to resurrection. Um, it's a little different thing. But why the, Sadducee- why the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection and why many other Jews did? Um, partly it goes back to this oral law idea. So the Pharisees said, look, God told us how to interpret the Old Testament. It doesn't really mention the resurrection, but in fact, it really does. And we know how to read it the right way. That's part of it. The Sadducees also put a lot more weight on the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. So Genesis through Deuteronomy. There's no mention of resurrection in those books. Um, Resurrection seems to have been an idea. Actually, heaven and hell are ideas that kind of developed over time. It's not that people didn't think about them early on. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but they didn't write about it. The later books of the Old Testament, you start to see more discussion of the afterlife and what's to come. And the Pharisees and many other Jews maybe put more equal weight on all the books where the Sadducees said, these, the, because the laws in the first five books, that's what we're going to focus on. And you just don't see resurrection language at all in those, in those books. I think, that's, I think that's right. Any other questions or comments or thoughts? No, that's right. Cremation is not a Jewish thing, right? Because your body is going to be raised again. And so it would be a, a tragedy to do it. Now, there are sometimes you can't help it, right? Um, if you are killed in a fire, right, you can't help, but you wouldn't normally do it. Yes? Could you just give us a, a quick summary of the similarities in, the, in Jesus' teaching and the themes? Sure. Sure. 30 seconds. Got it. All right. So one similarity is this last supper idea that you mentioned. They, they all ate communally at Qumran. Jesus ate communally with his disciples often. And the last supper is actually a good representation of that. So there's, um, that's one thing. Um, I got hurried, so now I'm blanking on what I was going to say. Um, oh, yeah. There's not a lot of overlap between Jesus' teachings and the Essenes. But one place you might see it is when Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, um, basically hate your enemies, right? But I tell you, love your enemies. Well, you would look forever to find hate your enemies in in the whole Testament. It's not there. But you will find it in their teaching, right? So some of these things where maybe we think, we can't find the Old Testament. We don't know what, what Jesus is talking about or we don't know what people are talking about. Well, some Jews in Jesus' day may have been saying it. In this particular case, they basically said, hey, your enemies are sons of darkness. Only love the people in the community. So that's one example. But I think my time's up. So thank you all very much.